So thank you for joining us for a dynamic panel discussion on the climate crisis and are we ready? So if you are new to the Red Cross, uh, my name is Kevin Coffey. I'm the proud CEO of the Eastern New York region. So I serve 27 counties. The Red Cross is broken up to a number of regions. And this is all the service delivery that happens each and every day. I saw so many familiar faces in the crowd tonight. So a lot of you are familiar with the work we do, whether it's collecting blood, responding to home fires, serving the military, CPR training. You're familiar with all of that work. And that work happens each and every day. And then we respond to large scale events and we deploy our local volunteers. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the tragic event that happened in Maine yesterday. And this afternoon I was getting requests for some of our staff members to deploy to Maine to open the Family Assistance Center to help families that have just lost loved ones and help them on their, uh, their kind of long road ahead in recovery. So the Red Cross and the mission of the Red Cross is happening each and every day in our communities and it's happening around the world. And that work happens in two phases. There's blue sky days and there's gray sky days. A blue sky day for us is, you know, there's no active disaster in this region. We're trying to do the smoke alarm installs. We're trying to be in the community, building capacity. Our blood drives are happening. And then there's gray sky days. Gray sky days are when those large scale disasters are happening. And we completely have to change our operating structure to be able to meet the needs of that community. Well, if you've been watching the news recently, you've probably seen more gray days than blue sky days for us. And that's not you know, your imagination. If you look on TV, every 17 days, we're responding to large scale climate events. This is national data from uh, NOAA, the government uh, agency. And thus far this year, we've had 24 separate billion dollar disasters. And we become blind almost to you know, the, the noise of what's happened and, and, and we become blind to the names. You know, was it Hurricane Adalia or Hurricane Florence or Michael? The names are becoming meaningless at this point. But these disasters keep happening. And it's really challenging because you know, we're seeing in the past 10 years, there is an increase of billion dollar disasters of 70%. This is creating a homeless crisis. We have 8.5 million people were forced for their homes due to disasters. And we're operating nearly twice, twice as many disaster relief operations than a decade ago. And this last statistic in the past five years, more category in four and five hurricanes have been made landfall than the previous 50 years combined. It's staggering. And it's a trend that we're gonna see continued. If you talk to Brad Kaiserman, who's the head of disaster operations for the Red Cross, he equates it to kind of a medical condition. So we're gone from acute disasters that may happen every once in a while or eventually to chronic. And we're going from disaster to disaster to disaster with little recovery. And this is happening in a country that's already frail. Low income and vulnerable populations suffer disproportionately from these major disasters. 34 million Americans are facing food insecurity. We have a housing, an affordable housing crisis issue, and then we're a sick country. Six in 10 Americans have a chronic illness. So not only are we responding to the disasters that happened, we're responding in communities that are already facing housing crises. They already have socially vulnerable communities. These are the frontline communities where these disasters are happening. And what's the impact on the Red Cross? Quite simply, demand is outpacing capacity. And not just for the Red Cross, it's for all disaster relief organizations, but the Red Cross is the premier organization in disaster relief and we're congressionally chartered to be there to do this work. But we have our staff and our volunteers going from one disaster right to the next. As we speak, I have a volunteer in Florida that's been down there for six consecutive weeks. That would be impressive on its own, but he's been on five disaster relief operations this year from Oregon to California to now Florida. So the exhaustion of our workforce is something that we need to contend with. We go to a lot of meetings and we talk about workforce development. We talk about you know, the need for more employees, but the workforce of the people that are gonna be doing this disaster relief work, how do we build capacity in our communities to provide some relief for them? 
I spoke about this a little bit earlier, but p the public's becoming a little bit numb to the disaster events. If I asked you some of the names of the disasters that happened this past year, would you be able to name anywhere close to 24 of them? Yet they were billion dollar disaster events that have devastated communities and they're still recovering right now. My brother lost his home in Superstorm Sandy uh, that happened several years ago. And he was fortunate that you know, he had you know, insurance and he was able to stay with my parents. It took him a year and a half to get back into his home after he was able to find contractors, after navigating both the FEMA dollars and the insurance dollars. It upended his life. And this is happening across the country. There's also changes in volunteerism that we're seeing. And this is where we're gonna really appeal to this room and this community that we really need to look about how we can tackle this humanitarian crisis. So I have a quick video that's gonna set the stage of the work that the Red Cross is doing, and then I'll welcome our esteemed panel to have a discussion on the climate change crisis. The climate crisis is upending millions of lives across the country and around the globe. We are witnessing a striking number of natural disasters with greater severity than ever before. In fact, the number of billion dollar disasters in the U.S. has increased by 70% over the past decade. The number of families affected will continue to rise in both volume and suffering. However, these disasters leave their most profound mark on low-income communities, as well as those who are older or living with disabilities. The people most impacted by climate disasters are already the most vulnerable. The devastation has a compounding effect on these communities, and we need your help in the face of this humanitarian crisis. Your support is critical and will help the American Red Cross remain at the front lines to provide aid as disasters intensify. As a leading disaster responder in the U.S., we're launching nearly twice as many relief operations than we did a decade ago in response to unrelenting and overlapping disasters. And sadly, many of the same communities are ravaged repeatedly. This crisis has stretched our ability to provide life-saving meals, shelter, health and mental health services, financial aid, and more to people with no place else to go. That's why we're expanding our capacity to deliver emergency aid, enhancing our large-scale relief and recovery services, using innovation where we can, and growing partner support networks in disaster-prone communities. Internationally, we're implementing new programs to reduce climate disaster risks in some of the most vulnerable high population areas. We're also creating grassroots pre-disaster plans and engaging with youth leaders to expand their local impact. We each play a role in responding to this crisis. So at the American Red Cross, we are also doing our part to reduce our own environmental footprint through cutting emissions, waste, and water use. Even with all of these efforts combined, we need to do more. With your help, the American Red Cross will invest $1.1 billion over the next five years to meet the growing needs of this humanitarian crisis. Your commitment ensures we can continue to help those who need it most. It is now my pleasure to welcome uh, and introduce Rose Miller, our Red Cross board chair uh, for the Northeastern New York chapter. Rose is the president of Sweet Advice and the former president of Pinnacle Human Resources. And if the panel would also like to join us up on stage. Um, Rose is an exceptional problem solver and moves initiatives forward. Um, we're incredibly fortunate to have Rose moderate this panel. Uh, what's not written here is Rose is an incredible humanitarian. Anytime we ask Rose to, to support, she's always there. She's always ready to kind of pick up the phone and, and help provide support. My favorite story that I tell all the time, during 2017, it was uh, Rose and Tim, her husband's anniversary, and they celebrated their anniversary by answering, answering phones for telephone that we were having to support hurricane victims. So thank you so much, Rose, for your leadership.
Thank you everyone for being here tonight. We have a wonderful panel for you tonight. I'm gonna to do some intros. So we have Mona Golub. She's the Vice President of Public Relations and Consumer Services for the newly merged Northeast Grocery, Inc. that's servicing Price Chopper, Market 32, and Top Supermarkets. Mona oversees corporate communications, community and government relations, consumer services, corporate social responsibility, and philanthropy for her, the 300 store chain. She's been a driving force behind many of the unique personalized partnerships that earned Price Chopper national recognition for its community involvement, customer connectivity, and social responsibility for years. Next we have Ellen Sachs. She's the MVP Vice President of Community Engagement in addition to developing and implementing MVP's philanthropic uh, focus, Ellen is responsible for expanding MVP's presence in the community through charitable giving, employee engagement, partnerships with non-for-profit organizations and community groups throughout MVP's footprint. Next, we have Dr. Havadon Rodriguez with us. He's the 20th president of the University of Albany and is the first Hispanic Latino president of a SUNY four-year institution. During Dr. Rodriguez's tenure, UAlbany has extended the reach of its global significant research while also becoming national leader for educational equity and social mobility. Dr. Rodriguez has over 30 years of experience as a leader in higher education and is respected social science scientist and scholar in disaster response and resiliency. We have Marie Sitzer is currently the director of New York Di Distribut Distributed Generation Ombudsperson at National Grid. She's serving as a liaison with customers, colleagues, and regulators for New York's distributed and generation projects. Marie has over 20 years in renewable and sustainable energy industries spanning energy storage, non-wire alternatives, utility scale wind and solar, fuel cells, and hydrogen generation. She does this, she says, to help leave her daughter and millions of daughters and sons a better world. Next, we have Josh Moskowitz, our Senior Disaster Program Manager. He started as a volunteer with the Red Cross in 2005, responding to Hurricane Rita. Josh has become a staff member, he became a staff member in 2016, and he's been deployed to over 20 disaster responses. And last but not least, we have Pierre Luca Bruno. He's the founder of Commercial Lending Advisors and is Red Cross a member of the board. Pierre started with the Red Cross in 2005 when his employer offered the opportunity to go to New Orleans to serve with the Red Cross after Katrina and Hurricane Rita. He has remained a committed Red Cross disaster relief ever since. He founded his company because he noticed it became harder for small businesses to find necessary funding. An entrepreneur, Pierre, can source the appropriate debt for his clients to succeed. So everyone, welcome our panel. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with you, Pierre, and my question to you is that, um, you did, you went on a, on a response. Could you tell us a little bit about your deployment story and how you became involved? Um, so it was back in 2005. I was working for Sovereign Bank as a credit analyst. And, uh, 
an email come across an email came across my desk uh, with an opportunity to write an essay, support a, a, and provide a video explaining why you know the bank should have picked me to be deployed to help uh, the victims of Katrina and Rita. So I went through the process, and sure enough, uh, my name was selected. Uh, my employer encouraged me to go down for two weeks. I went through a, uh, a vigorous uh, training exercise. I think it was three or four days of, of training online and uh, in the classroom, and uh, was deployed uh, in November. Uh, while I was in uh, New Orleans, uh, my first experience was in a shelter. Right? So I helped uh, open a shelter and manage um, uh, our clients as they came in and out. And you know, the, the immediate impact um, on myself as I noticed uh, these people that, that lost everything. Um, uh, from there, I was moved into a, um, a distribution role where I set up shop every morning uh, in a parking lot and people drove through and picked up um, water, diapers, batteries, um, numerous supplies. Um, <clears throat> I was enjoying myself, right, the, the feeling of, of giving back to the community uh, so much that I asked my employer to uh, utilize two weeks of my vacation time so I could stay an additional two weeks. Um, so the fact that I'm here, that, that was 2005 uh, in Boston, right, I moved to this area in 2000. Um, 13, so 10 years ago, and um, you know we're always looking for ways to 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 support the organization, support the need. Um, obviously, you saw the video here where uh, it used to be hurricanes. Now it's now it's everything. Um, so when I moved here and I met Kevin, you know one of the things that we talked about was getting our our corporate partners involved. Um, hopefully, we can provide a platform like like my employer did where uh, we encourage our teams to, to, um, to get trained and make themselves available. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pierre. And it's yeah. important to note that there is preparation that's needed and training that's needed. I mean, many individuals come to a site they have found and, and want to help, but they can't help because they need to go through that proper training. So having a corporate initiative like that is so helpful. So I wanted to open up to the rest of the panel. Um, you know, how has climate, uh, the climate crisis impacted your business, your service delivery, um, considerations with your employees? Anyone can start. For me, it's with my clients. I notice it, you know, um, it's harder and harder to predict the weather, right? Um, seasonality used to be, you know, summer and winter, maybe some rain in the spring. Seasonality is, is any time. I mean, look, it's going to be 76 degrees on Saturday. Uh, so, so our clients have a hard time, you know, a contractor in the summer. Uh, this past summer we had a lot of rain, uh, very difficult to work outside. Uh, so our, 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 you know, my clients are, are you know, they're, it's harder to predict how long a project's going to take, which costs more who to hire, how many people to have on staff. Uh, so that, 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 that's how it impacts my business. Uh, from, from my perspective uh, as a staff member for Red Cross, our service delivery has been profoundly in, impacted by climate crisis, specifically around our ability to provide that direct service. So um, we are seeing larger and more frequent disasters, which means we are doing twice as much work. We're, we're looking at a 10% increase already over last year um, in the number of large-scale disasters that we're seeing. So at the same time, we're also seeing a change in the dynamic of our volunteers. So those two things combined mean that we are having to do a lot more service with a lot less resources. So the one thing I wanted to, a couple things that I wanted to address relative to National Grid is um, obvious service delivery is important all the time. Reliable electric and gas delivery is, is very important. We've had some severe storms that have an impact on that. Every one, of us at the, every, every one of us at the company, when we apply to join the company or when, we, when we're looking at, at promotions or opportunities, that we recommit to 
having a storm role in a storm assignment. And if a storm, if it's, whether it's thunderstorms, whether it's snowstorms, um, we all need to mobilize and our number one priority is, is service restoration. And it's, it, it is the only focus that is important for any of us who are on, on storm duty at the time. And what we've been seeing is more and more of these extreme storms, longer times for service restoration. And the, there's the one storm that, that comes immediately to mind is almost a year ago in Buffalo when there was that six feet of snow. Mm -hmm. um, we had employees that were stuck in the office and they didn't have any way to get food. There was no food delivery and it was after COVID. So there was not the same level of food availability, vending, and it was, um, some of my colleagues were going through drawers to find granola bars, what stash, the stash of snacks that are kept in the offices that we, we just kind of take for granted, which now I purposely leave some things in my office in the drawer in case that were to happen here, and my colleagues may be um, stranded in, in those offices and not able to get those services. So we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of impact on our, our ability to restore and the need to, be very strategic in uh, storm planning. So um, in addition to our employees, we have subcontractors that we use that we need to mobilize, and we need to mobilize them early so that they're available to provide service restoration. One thing that we can speak to if there's time is also, in addition to immediate storm needs, is looking at how are we building a resilient grid. So building up the uh, ability for us to withstand higher winds, more ice, um, extreme temperatures. So extreme temperatures in the summer, it is taxing not only because of the air conditioning and the load, but it also has an impact on our lines and the integrity of our lines. Um, heat plus electricity uh, usually ha leads to some additional wear and tear on those lines. So we've, um, we've had a, a climate resiliency working group and we're engaged with the communities around the state, uh, communities and, and our customers um, and a lot of the communities. So we have um, the ability for us to, to take a look at where are the areas of highest vulnerability and how do we ensure that those areas of high vulnerability are hardened, are there's additional resiliency in those areas so that when these these uh, more severe storms and these the storm events come through that uh, we don't have as much to work on because we have a hardened grid and hardened, there, there's there's hundreds of people within our organization who are dedicating time and effort to this. So it's it's a ultimate focus um, and, and we're very dedicated to, to providing a more resilient, reliable grid. And I would say from uh, the U University at Albany's perspective, of course it's an institution of higher education. I think we divide it into three different buckets education, research, and service. And in terms of education, it's changed our mode of delivery and instruction by providing additional academic programs that really deal with the communities and better understanding, responding to, uh, and working with uh, disasters and weather events, right? So for example, seven years ago, we established the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity. That's an entire college, the first in the nation, and the only in the nation that's exclusively devoted to focusing on climate change, disasters, weather events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Establishing a, pro a program on environmental uh, engineering, again, taking a look at the weather impact, uh, environmental impacts on our infrastructure, and also atmospheric and environmental sciences, which really focuses on climate and weather. So a variety of academic programs to better educate our students, our community, in terms of the impacts and the consequences of disaster events. And of course, on the, on the research side, we have many, many researchers. For example, our uh, uh, Climate and Environmental Sciences program is one of the largest uh, PhD programs of its kind in the country, and they devote themselves to doing research, sponsored research, to better understand, better uh, predict, track, detect, and determine the impact of these disasters. And then on the service side, we engage with community partners. Our researchers work with uh, state agencies, National Power Grid, uh, with the Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, with the American Red Cross, and other agencies to provide the services that we can as an institution of higher education. So 
For example, following the impact of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico in 2017, I co-chaired a task force uh, which sent uh, over a thousand students, faculty, and staff to Puerto Rico across 37 SUNY institutions uh, as to help the, the population deal with uh, the impacts of disasters and, and, and focusing on disaster relief. So again, we look at it from the education, the research, and the service side. Um, I think about the disaster that occurred in the spring um, that impacted both the Hudson Valley and Vermont. And for us, it impacted our employees, it impacted the greater community, and it impacted our members. And so we reach out to the American Red Cross to see what we can do to help, trying to get food to people who needed it. I mean, it was as <laughs> when you saw those pictures and the disasters that were out there, we were in touch with Mona and what Price Chopper was doing and how we could get food and, and resources and what our employees could do to assist in that capacity. So that's how we look. Well, our higher purpose in the supermarket business uh, is helping people feed and take care of themselves and their families. So on a blue sky day, um, <laughs> this is a pretty straightforward proposition. Uh, when weather is forecasted, um, we can plan for it. We can make sure when we know snow is coming that our stores are stocked with the items that people need to have, the batteries, the diapers, the shovels, the scrapers, the snow melt. Um, when it comes as a surprise, that's a whole different animal. And frankly, when you're dealing uh, with perishable product as we do, um, as opposed to power, you have a whole model, a system that's built on delivery to various stores, and one truck after another after another is going here to there to there to there, and any disruption to that means that you run the potential of sacrificing your ability to get product to where it needs to be when it needs to be there. Uh, so climate crisis definitively um, has been an issue for us. Uh, and we plan for it. In fact, our planning expert for emergency preparedness is here with us tonight, uh, my friend Mike Gully. Uh, and he has a team that works with one of the many acronyms that he shared with me before tonight. Um, the LEPCs, the Local Emergency Planning Committees, which most counties have. And basically, they bring together first responders, um, county resources, business, education, medical. Uh, and they figure out in, in terms of evaluating the resources that we all have, how to participate together in response activities that can help in those situations. So we find ourselves planning for more of them because we simply have to. That's great. Um, I mean, there's so many things that I just learned from all of you, and I hope you did too. I mean, the fact that we have a university with a program that's the only one in the country, that's pretty spectacular. Um, and Mona, you've, your stores have seen the trend of climate, uh, the impact on your stores, and you, you've explained some of the things that you're doing. Um, Want to speak on any of the recent disasters and how it impacted your employees and stores? You probably have a, a story or two. <laughs> well, you know, recognizing that we're not just a place of products and services, we're a gathering space for community. Um, so in the throes of natural disaster and when caretaking becomes that much more of a challenge, uh, it's human nature to want to help. And we're in these situations in our stores with hundreds of people coming in every day and, and people want to help. They want to do something they don't know what to do. They're calling. They want to donate something. They want to be somewhere. And they want to know where and how and what. And, and that is really where the Red Cross comes in. Um, we've learned over time that we need to listen because you can't assume that you know what's needed. People want to throw piles of food, they want to throw clothing, they want to collect whatever they can, um, but that may not necessarily be what's needed. And that's really the lesson we learned early on in our partnership a few decades ago with the Red Cross. God bless them that they have boots on the ground and people who are assessing the actual needs, one to the next, being able to prioritize those. 
so that we know, you know, when there's a flood like Irene or Lee, it's going to be a mess. They need to clean up first. What do they need to be able to clean up with? When do you send the shovels and the brooms? When do you bring the bleach? How do you provide meals? How do you help people who are, who are not in their homes, who are needing community meals somewhere? Um, you know, being able to assess what's needed uh, is really the most important piece of all of this because you can't apply resources unless you assess what's needed, find out, know and understand what's needed, and then look at your resource team and figure out, okay, they have the food. Okay, they have the trucks or the vans to get it from here to there. Okay, that organization has that building which is okay and can bring people in and, and serve them or help them or provide for them there. It's one to the next, um, really being able to, to hold hands and connect by understanding what each of us has to offer as a resource and how together we can be that solution that's needed, whatever it may be. Well said, Mona. Ellen, you've been a uh, leader of volunteerism. Maybe you can tell the crowd, how do you think volunteer programs impact, impact a corporate culture? Sure. So in 20, can you hear me okay? So in 2013, we conducted a culture survey. And two things that came out of that that we focused on were people felt that they were in silos and they weren't getting to know people across the company. And the second was that people wanted to give back to the community. So we took that and we said, let's create a service time off program. And we give our employees seven and a half hours off a year to volunteer. They can do it in parts and pieces or they can do it all in one day. Um, and it had, it had grown exponentially. In fact, in 2019, we had about 86% of our employees participating. And it was wonderful to see. So when you talk about the impact of culture, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And then we know it happened in 2020. Um, and so it's um, been a little bit more challenging now to uh, get people to get out of their jammy bottoms and go out and volunteer. But what we have started to do is not just focus on our service time off program, but we also look at independent volunteering because we know that our employees give back on their own time, whether it's service on a board or it's um, helping an organization that they're committed to. And so we recognize that as part of our volunteerism program as well. And one of the things we realize is the importance of, for example, giving blood. And we know how important that is for our country. And so while we have a minimum requirement of 3.5 hours that employees must volunteer, we alter that so people can give blood because we know it doesn't take three and a half hours to give blood. Um, so we allow for our employees to give blood as often as they want because we know that that's an important resource as well. So I have to say that the volunteerism has made a big difference in our company. I know from an HR perspective, it's very much a bonding moment to all go together and volunteer to an event. It is. Yeah. They come back energized. It's wonderful. If I can just add one comment, Rose, yep, relative to resources, because sometimes they exist where you don't expect them to be. You know that you're going to see a supermarket like Price Chopper or Market 32 provide a trailer if there's no power and food needs to be preserved, or, or we'll be able to donate water or paper goods or pet food or personal hygiene items uh, and working with our, our very generous trade partners. But I remember back to the flooding, again, Irene and Lee, uh, as, as I was looking back on that, I can't believe how many years ago it was, um, we had folks from our produce team who were helping farmers in Schoharie um, whose crops had been flooded, who, who needed the kind of help that only they knew how to give. We had people in our finance and accounting departments working with residents whose homes had been obliterated, trying to help them find grants and opportunities to, to get their homes back in shape. Um, I mean, during the pandemic, we became testing sites in our stores. In the wake of the pandemic, we became vaccine centers. You never really know where the call is going to be, but you need to be able to step back and, and think about all the various 
solutions you can provide in any given situation uh, and reach the skills and resources that the employees have. You're absolutely right. And that brings me to you, Havadon. You know, you have this education piece. So can you tell us uh, a little bit more about um, what career skills um, will support future needs? And tell us a little bit more about that program. So, so thank you, Rose. Uh, and I come at this question from two different perspectives. One, uh, as someone, as a researcher who's been doing uh, research on the social and economic impacts of disasters for, for the past 30, 30 years. So I've led t research teams to uh, Honduras following Hurricane Mitch, uh, to Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria, to the Gulf Coast following uh, Hurricane Katrina, to India and Sri Lanka following the Indian Ocean tsunami, going to Stillwater, Oklahoma in the middle of uh, Tornado Alley to better understand the impact uh, of these events. So that's been a, a process and a research that I've published extensively in this area to better understand how societies prepare and respond to these events, and in turn, how can we work with our students, with our college population, to uh, inculcate the training that they need in order to continue and grow in this space, right? And as you know, this, this whole topic about, uh, about weather and disasters has become much more complex and complicated with climate change, with all the impacts that it's having. You know, the 100-year floods seem to be coming one-year floods all of a sudden, right? And so we have to uh, deal with that. So emergency managers, disaster responders have to become increasingly more sophisticated. And in terms of higher education, it is, it is a field that spans so many disciplines from academic and environmental sciences to public health, meteorology, uh, public policy, the social sciences as well play a critical impact uh, or critical role uh, in studying these events. So when we establish the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, the main goal was that, to provide students with undergraduate and de graduate degrees to better prepare them to become emergency managers, to work with agencies such as the American Red right, right Cross or public and private industries that are focused on dealing with these uh, disaster events because they become very, very complicated. Right, and we like to say, as, so, as a social scientist, uh, that uh, you know disasters are are, are not uh, a sort of. Uh, come on their own. They're human-made. They're a product of what we do in society. So we have increasing population and more and more people living, living in flood-prone areas, more and more people living in areas exposed to hurricanes, more and more people living in uh, uh, areas that are, uh, are prone to landslides. And so no wonder every time you have, as Kevin uh, said in, in his presentation, Every time you have a disaster, it becomes much more costly in terms of the damage to infrastructure and in the loss of life because we have more and more people encroaching, right, and living in harm's way. And so those are the things that, that we study at the university at Albany and trying to prepare our students in our communities to better understand these disasters. Or establishing uh, technology, for example, if you look at the New York State Mesonet at Albany, at U Albany, just in case you haven't heard about the New York State Mesonet, it's a complex structure of 126 weather stations across the state of New York that are collecting weather every five minutes across the state. You can actually go on, get the app for New York State Mesonet, and log in, and you can see what's happening in every single county in the state of New York. We use that information to work with local industries, with the state, to better uh, respond to these disaster events, whether it be the power grid, impacts on infrastructure, et cetera. We also have a very nice group that we formed at the University at Albany in our College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, uh, which is called Virtual Operations Support Team, or VOST, V-O-S-T, which is a group of students to monitor. They monitor on a regular basis social media around crisis situations and have to respond to needs in New York City, in New Jersey, in Texas, 
and beyond, right? So these are the types of things that we as institutions of higher education do because we play a critical role. We like to believe that the University at Albany is an anchor institution in the capital region. So how can we better serve our communities and how can we better serve institutions of higher education? So uh, at the end of November, I'm traveling to Texas to a major conference and I'm gonna be in a panel in which I'm gonna be talking about the role of institutions of higher education in dealing with, responding to, uh, and, uh, and, and, and doing research uh, in the area of weather and disasters. Institutions of higher education play a critical role, as I said before, in my three buckets, right? Education, research, and service. And Marie, you talked a little bit about how National Grid's adapting to climate crisis events. Um, what do you think the community and businesses can do to better prepare when events happen? There's a, there's a number of different things that can be considered for communities and business. Um, the, the thing that we were looking at from our overall system network on the operations and planning function is the areas that are more sustainable to some of these extreme conditions. The higher temperatures that I mentioned before, some inland flooding, if there's high winds and ice. And all of those have an impact on our ability to provide that emergency response. We need to do vegetation management around um, all of our assets to make sure that if there's uh, trees that are damaged uh, or there's trees that, that, that may have been, um, or older trees that could cause damage, we have a, a vegetation management group that goes through and, and monitors that every several years. Um, the, the thing that, that works, uh, and that, the, the couple of the things where businesses can get more involved is evaluating, um, helping us to evaluate what the load and the capacity needs are. So how much, how much energy is being used? Has your organization looked at energy efficiency programs? Is there an opportunity for you to get involved in uh, programs that can uh, improve your, or decrease your overall draw on the system because as time goes on and more things are, are more electric vehicles come online, it taxes our, it, it stresses a, um, an aging infrastructure so that we need to identify a balance and a need to, to work with the communities to, to determine how do, we, how do we get more efficient in some of the, the lighting projects that we may use or the refrigeration projects that are, the refrigeration um, needs that are, are having that our, our customers have and the businesses have, along with the, the shift in the portfolio of what's happening around electrification. So if you haven't had the opportunity to have uh, a conversation with anyone with our group to talk about energy efficient efforts, or if there's opportunities for you to look at these programs, I've got a couple of my colleagues that are here in the, in the, the audience today that that's their area of expertise. Um, and we're looking to, to support the, the communities in that transition. So those, those extreme events are things that have an impact on our blue sky days, but on our blue sky days, we can look at how do we decrease that, the load that is being drawn by our customers in a way that's more sustainable and long term, because we are integrating renewable energy. Uh, renewable energy. Part, of, part of what my role, direct role is, is to look at how do we integrate more solar and wind battery energy storage and other renewable energy sources. So um, the more that we have, have a, a balance on what the load is and the generation, the, the easier it is for us to, to maximize that interconnection. And Josh, you've been on over 20 uh, disaster events and as a frontline disaster responder, what keeps you up at night? There are so many things. Um, I, I would say one of the, the first things is we find ourselves right now uh, facing a perfect storm of circumstance where we're seeing a changing paradigm in what our volunteers are willing to give um, as well as an increase in the need for our services partly because of this climate crisis. So. Um, for, for me, always worrying about, am I going to have enough people to actually be able to staff a shelter is what keeps me up at night most of the time. Um, 
if you want to talk about a specific climate crisis um, aspect of what keeps me up at night, I would have to say it probably is water. Um, water is the thing that scares me the most. Um, whether it's regular flooding, you know, we, we've had a couple of storms over the last couple of months here that have caused us to, to wind up some shelters um, and, and have to keep folks in housing for, for at least a couple of weeks. We have a shelter open right now in the city of Schenectady, um, which is thankfully and luckily being fed by Price Chopper Meals. So thank you very much with our, our wonderful partners at, at Price Chopper. Um, but if you think about climate crisis and, and the direct impacts it has, and so what kinds of disasters are going to see the most direct effects on us, both as individuals, but also as part of a larger community. Um, when you think about water and you think about flooding, um, you have to keep in context how many people live in harm's way. Mm -hmm. In this country, nearly 40% of our total population lives in a coastal county. So if you think about that in terms of economics, if you took just those folks who live in coastal counties in the United States and you looked at them as a separate nation altogether, those 40% of US citizens would combine to show a national GDP that is third in the, in the world only to the U.S. as a whole and China. So there's a lot of people, a lot of resource, and a lot of wealth living in those coastal areas. Globally, coastal flooding could th threaten assets worth up to 20% of our glo global GDP within the next 10 years. Flooding is a really big problem, whether it's inland flooding from rainstorms, whether it's coastal flooding, whether it's storm surge, we're seeing an increase in the numbers across the board. So probably the biggest place that that impacts us is it takes away our ability to plan well. We have historical averages. We have historical data that we look at to make our plans. How many, based on this size storm, how many people do I think I need to run a shelter? How many meals am I gonna need to feed? Well, if you look at Hurricane Otis, just a few hours ago, made one of the fastest jumps from a small hurricane to a Cat 5 hurricane that scientists have ever seen. And in the three or four interviews I saw today with, with meteorologists, they all said the same thing. We, we got nothing. We don't know why this happened. So our planning assumptions have changed. Mm -hmm. And we have to change the way that we look at those things. We can change the way we look at the paradigm of disaster response, um, recovery, and preparedness, or we can let a storm change it for us. It would be our choice. But either way, that choice is going to get made. So for me, flooding is the really big issue. So my last question, I'm going to ask each one of you, we'll start with Pierre. Um, any parting thoughts on how the community can all come together in case we have a climate crisis here in the, in the capital region, what could we do? Well, as I mentioned, I'm here you know, 18 years after my employer encouraged me to give back by volunteering. In this case, it was the Red Cross. So um, I, you know, all of us, most of us work for somebody. Uh, we work with other people. We have colleagues. We have family. Uh, so uh, we can impact. Um, the next climate issue in this in this area by encouraging our colleagues, our employers, and our families to to volunteer, right? to go online, take a Red Cross class, um, and let's grow this population and let's help help Josh sleep at night because he, yeah, he he needs like people. <laughs> uh, for from my perspective, it's it's very much we need people, we need bodies, um, and, and we need you. We need. The community leaders, uh, we, we call you guys gatekeepers because that's what you are. You can open the gate to resources that are needed. Um, we can't do it alone. Our, our old way of just looking for an individual volunteer, please come and help and join our team, it just doesn't work anymore. We need you guys to open up those gates to the resources and the, the leadership that you provide already to our community. 
So one of the things I'd be remiss at not commenting about is an effort that National Grid started a few years ago, and it's something that we're calling Project C, and it's our way of giving back to communities. And we had started in 2021, where it was, I want to say it was September 17th, it was a Friday, where there were a number of, of the regions within New York State, we took an effort to bring back our, uh, bring back a lot of the folks together after um, the, the separation that COVID had caused, but also how do we focus directly on the immediate needs of our community. So I was leading a group of about 40 or 50 people, including executives, uh, line workers at Patroon, Fa Patroon Farm oh, down, in, down near uh, Thatcher Park. And it was helping them give back to the community that, that the, the work that we had done went right to the regional food bank. So, it, and it was a way for us to reconnect and, and, and get those relationships back together with our colleagues after, after the period of time with COVID. It's since then expand, it's since expanded to a week-long effort that's a dedicated week where I think there were over 2,000 people this year in that midweek in September donated time across New York State. Um, a lot of us donated time here in the Capital Region um, as larger teams, some, some of it was smaller teams. So as a company, we're committed to our local com communities. As individuals within the company, we're committed, committed to the, the company's efforts, but also our regional efforts. So if there's inspiration with some of the other business leaders to, to, to give back to the community, think about creative ways. What was, that, what, what, what was said earlier on dedicated time, enabling us and, and empowering individuals with the, within our organization to do the things that are important to them. We continue to host blood drives. We continue to do a lot of things that we've always done, and we've stepped it up as an organization. And it makes me proud to be part of that organization because we are giving back directly to the communities. From my perspective, there's a there's a couple of things we need we need to do in the capital region and beyond. First is focus on building partnerships, right? Creating the partnerships, for example, between higher education, industry, state government, and other organizations, corporations, so that when a disaster does happen, we, we are coming together as a community. You know, typically people say, well, this was a disaster because communication uh, broke down. Well, typically, communication was not good to begin with. It just got worse uh, with the disaster, right? So unless we develop those strategic partnerships in order to better respond to these events, that that is going to be a critically important issue. So communication uh, is also key. And we have to move away from a society which is, as it relates to disasters or weather events, uh, we are a reactive society. So an event happens and we react. We need to really focus on the front end, on mitigation, on preparedness. Actually, if we spent 10% of what we invest in disaster relief, unpreparedness and mitigation, we can alleviate a lot of the suffering and loss of life as a consequence of these, uh, of these events. And finally, I think there's a great need to continue to increase education, increase awareness to better educate our communities in terms of what we do. Because at the end of the day, we think about first responders when an event happens. Guess what? Who are the first responders? You are. Your neighbors are, you know, the, 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 the army will come down, but it'll, it'll take some time before they get there. So we need to establish those linkages and those partnerships to better respond to these events. And of course, I have to say, a undergraduate, a master's, or the doc, doctoral degree from the University at Albany in this area wouldn't help, wouldn't hurt either, right? So there you go. I don't want to repeat what's been said because I think you're getting the flavor, but I think we need to educate as employers and as business owners, we need to educate our employees. And I think as long as they recognize and can hear that we are committed to what we can do to help in a disaster, in preparedness, um, and then the resources that our employees have to offer so that they are ready to assist. Couldn't agree more. I think, you know, it, it, it tugs at your heartstrings. Mm -hmm. People, as I said earlier, they want to react, they want to do something. It's why the partnership we call Your Help Counts um, that we do with the American Red Cross uh, and our friends now at, at Channel WTEN, uh, 10 ABC, gets the word out to people so they have a place, they have a trusted channel, they know where they can come to to do something rather than sit home and wring their hands watching the television. 
Um, it's an entry point, and I think it's the beginning of a conversation, and we could leverage it to be more of a conversation. You know, it's nice to be able to go to any open register and make that donation and know that 100% of it goes directly through the Red Cross to those who need it most. But when you see the influx of people who want to make that difference and who make that donation, that could, would do something more if they knew what to do. I think there's opportunity for us to expand upon that. So we could have some new partnerships right here from this table up here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to open up to the audience an opportunity to ask the panel any questions. A lot of pep talks <laughs> and coffee. That's <laughs> pep talks, coffee, and chocolate tend to be what we, we live on. Um, it's tough, but one of the things I love about Red Cross is everyone is there to do a mission. Whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a staff member, we kind of look at everybody the same, that we don't make that determination. Um, and every single person I've ever worked with at Red Cross is there to help and make a difference. So gets hard and the hours are long, but everybody's there for the right reason, so it makes it a little bit easier. Mark. So there's a, there's a number of approaches to that. Use less is one. Um, energy efficiency is really important on a day-to-day -day blue sky practice is LED lighting uh, to look at different ways to get a smart home and, and, a, and, and decrease your usage. Um, shifting over to, to more fuel efficient cars. I mean, this is less about grid, but more about human practice as far as using less fossil fuels. So there's uh, a number of efforts that we've got underway um, in supporting New York State's aggressive, uh, we're here to serve and support New York State's aggressive climate goals and renewable energy goals. So uh, we're looking at how do we decrease the time for us to interconnect the renewable energy projects. Um, with the projects that are, are coming up now, it's taking longer for us to interconnect because it's more complicated. There have been a lot of great sites that have been built out with these renewable energy projects. They're getting more complicated. The grid is getting a little more constrained. Um, so we're looking at how do we, how do we do that more proactively and, and more quickly. So we're looking at, at both decreasing the time, but decreasing the complexity and figuring out new and innovative ways can, that we can approach it. We, we recently had a, a, a technical challenge that we thought was gonna be a really big hurdle for us to get through, and we had a, a focused team of some of our engineers looking at that, and it decreased, within about four months, we were able to decrease the overall impact by an order of magnitude, and you know, hundreds of millions of dollars down to um, $20 million. So it, it's, it, it's, it's something that I showcase within our engineering team too, is there are ways that we can, we can take, uh, um, and I've heard this reference, it's not the, the reference that National Grid necessarily uses, but it's the, the approach during World War II where everyone mobilized around this is a, is a really important thing that we need to all solve together. 
is we're looking at that from National Grid too, is how do we get these, these resources on and interconnected into our system faster so that we can retire more of the fossil fuels that are being used to create the energy that we're all consuming. So the first thing is start with efficiency, start at home um, and, and share it with your neighbors and share it with your family and, and National Grid has a lot of programs that can support. And I think building on that, uh, we have to be consistent as, uh, as a country in terms of land use patterns as well, right? Uh, you look at some places in Florida and New Orleans, et cetera, where they were completely devastated by hurricanes and things of that nature. And a few la years later, that, that place is all over uh, inhabited again with new infrastructures, et cetera, waiting for the next disaster event, right? So land use patterns and better control over that is going to be critical because we, as I said before, we're encroaching upon the environment and no wonder we're being impacted by these events. And the other issue is dealing with issues of vulnerability and resiliency. And I think Kevin mentioned this, right? Uh, when you look at New Orleans, it seems that the United States for the first time discovered that there was extensive poverty in New Orleans, right? Uh, when that was, you know, been swept under the rug for a long time. We're talking about, you know, how uh, Hurricane Katrina devastated stated the healthcare system, but we forget in New Orleans, but we forget that the healthcare system was already ranked 48th or 49th uh, in New Orleans across the country. Uh, and so those are issues that we have to systematically deal with. The University at Albany, as you know, Mark, led a study here uh, for the governor on the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, because communities of color uh, had higher incidences of, of uh, COVID-19, were more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to die as a consequence of COVID. That was due to the social and economic barriers and access to health care that these individuals confronted and continue to confront. So these are the issues we have to take as a society and as state governments and federal governments deal with these critical issues. Else, you know, we'll be talking about the next disaster and we'll be dealing with the same issues as well, uh, all over again because, again, we tend to be reactive rather than proactive focusing on disaster relief rather than on disaster mitigation and preparedness. I think, I think Mona, you mentioned it too, is, is instead of waiting for somebody else to solve the problem is how can you be part of the solution? So it, it's something, Rose, to my bio, is, is something I, I decided early in my career that um, I'm, I committed my career to renewable and sustainable energy. And I didn't realize until a few years ago when I joined National Grid that's something I could do within the company. And every choice you make is something that you can learn and, and pass on to others and others can learn from you. So I, I, I can't, um, it's, an, it's, a, it's really amazing the power of, of the community that you build around you mm -hmm. and the influence that, that can have on you and what influence you, every individual sitting in this seat that's here today that's concerned about this can have on your community, your peers, your family. So don't discount that. Ed, you had a question, no? <laughs> Anyone else? Well, first of all, let me, let me highlight that you know we're we're very proud to. Yeah, uh, in terms of the graduates that are graduating, um, particularly from the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, uh, what jobs are they getting? Where are they going? What impact are they are they having? Uh, but first, let me say, you, since you mentioned the American Red Cross, I think we've got a, you know, a really strong and sustainable and very productive partnership between the University at Albany and the American Red Cross here, uh, which we're very proud of, right? And our students do uh, amazing work, and the American Red Cross does amazing work uh, at the University at Albany. The, 
you know, one of the great things about being a student in this college at the undergraduate and graduate level is that you basically have a job before you graduate, right? Uh, you be, you're being employed by many agencies, American Red Cross, by FEMA, by the Department of Homeland Security and Cybersecurity, by state and federal agencies, both public and private. So there are many, many opportunities for our students, whether it be in the emergency preparedness, disaster space, whether it be in cybersecurity or in homeland security. And so our students are being recruited uh, locally, regionally, and nationally, and having really great opportunities uh, to pursue uh, great careers uh, in higher education, in industry, in nonprofit organizations, etc. Let's have a round of applause for this amazing panel tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing discussion. And, and those partnerships that we talk about, we just see them on display in real time. So this week there was a disaster that Josh was talking about with the shelter that we have open in Schenectady. And we have a partnership with CDTA so they can transport the shelter residents to the YMCA. Because I talked to Dave Brown and they said, we have a national MOU. Can we use your facilities for showers? Of course. We have to have these discussions and we have to create these partnerships now before the event happens. So one way we can do this is Red Cross Ready Teams. And this is our, this is our big ass. This is what we would like to do. We'd like you to join us and we'd like you to think about your organization and how you can create your own team to help the Red Cross respond. And what resources do you have? What things do you have in your employee base that you can bring to support in a disaster relief organization? If you can find a team leader in your organization, that allows us to know who's on the bench that we can call up to say, can you help when the time comes? Um, this weekend at the University of Albany, we're hosting a disaster action team summit. I have 60 volunteers from around Eastern New York all coming into town. Before you leave, please take a moment and sign that little poster that says volunteers are heroes. Because uh, these volunteers are spending their entire weekend learning about advanced you know, disaster public affairs from one of our incredible volunteers, Mary Alice. They're learning about government operations, probably from Jack is H and the team. And they're learning from other volunteers what they can do to help you know, communities respond. And I think this panel really put it best when they just talked about community. This is our community. And we need to be ready to stand to help one another when times come. And when we think about community, we think about you know leaders in our community. And you're all leaders, and that's why you're in this room tonight. And I just want to leave the, the panel and, and this audience with some words from uh, Mr. Rogers. My mother used to say a long time ago, whenever there would be any catastrophe that was on the air, she would say, always look for the helpers. Because if you look for the helpers, you'll know that there's hope. So I want to thank our panel. I want to thank Rose. And I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, we are stronger as a community when we have events like this. And I hope this is the start of a conversation that we continue to have to build capacity and help us respond. So thank you all for joining us tonight.